But this morning, we're going to start a new series this morning. We're going to start a new series. It's called Home Improvement. Now, this is not about, you know, Tim the Toolman Taylor. This is not about, you know, we're not going to start asking you to, you know, give him building projects or anything else. But this is about the modern family. It's going to be, you know, because we know that the modern family in and of itself is in trouble, right? It is in trouble. Divorce is rampant. Dissatisfaction between you know, spouses is at an all-time high. Parents have lost their way, and they are, uh, they are watching their children lose uh, you know, theirs as well, as far as you know, that they're just having just this dissatisfaction. The modern family has lost its anchor, its bearings. The modern family has lost its, you know, all these things, has lost its bearings, has lost its anchor. There was a time, and it was not so long ago, that families actually at least acknowledged God, His word, and His right to rule in the home. But that day has, uh, has long since passed. It's sad to think, because the thing is, is that I remember growing up, going to school, and one of the things that we would do was the Pledge of Allegiance. Nowadays, you don't even have to say that. Why? Because it mentions God. And so when I grew up, that was just something that we did. You know, we got up, we did the Pledge of Allegiance and those things, you know, as well. But now it's like, you know what, if you want to sit there and, you know, sit in your seat or, you know, do whatever and don't want to say it, it's up, you know, they say, well, it's up to you because it mentions God. We don't want you to force God upon you anymore. The family needs to be brought back to God. The family needs to be deeply anchored in the things of God if it is to survive. Oftentimes, nowadays, what ends up happening is that you know, people say, you know what, well, my parents, it, their marriage didn't seem all that well, so I'm not going to get married. I'll just live with the other person. And we'll have a family that way. The thing is, is that it's not about you. It's about setting a standard for your kids. It's about setting a standard and doing what God has asked you to do. As I said earlier, obviously the modern family is a mess. There are examples here and there of godly families in action, but most families are adrift on a tossing sea of immorality, selfishness, and discontent. How many times have you ever heard of an actor or actress, they get divorced, why? Irreconcilable differences. In other words, they just couldn't get along anymore. They didn't want to work it out, they didn't whatever. As soon as you know, the whole love bug you know, wore off of them, they were like, you know what, I don't want to be with you anymore. And they kick them to the curb. But, over the, but the modern family can be saved. It can be saved. When families know and honor the unchanging principles of the Word of God in their lives, they can survive. Families can even thrive in this world if they are given the right tools, the right encouragement, and the right path to follow. Over the next several weeks, I'm going to be preaching a series of sermons on the family at, that I have titled this series, as I said earlier, home improvement. We say that our world needs saving, and it does, but if the world is to be changed from what it is, that change must begin in the home. That can't just happen on a Sunday morning for a couple hours or on a Wednesday night for a couple hours. It must happen at the home. I only get to speak to you for you know, a couple hours a week, and that's it. Hopefully, you're reading the Word of God throughout the week, so that way the Bible can speak to you throughout the week as well. There must be improvement in our homes before there can be improvement in the world. It starts at home. It doesn't start with, you know, uh, you know, with watching you know, the news and the news telling you what to do. It doesn't even start with you, you know, by watching an old television show of what you know, things should be. It starts with the Word of God. When I speak about, like I said, uh, when I speak about this subject of home improvement, like I said, it's not about putting on a new roof. It's not installing a hot tub. It's not, you know, talking about, you know, painting the walls. I am talking about the fact of strengthening your marriages, helping your kids become the men and women of God God wants them to be, and turning your homes into a, a small slice of heaven in this world that we can do that, but we need to do a little home improvement to make it happen. So as the Lord leads, and, you know, I want to deal with you know, some of the topics that affect the modern family. Then I'm going to preach about some, uh, some of those things that affect the family. I believe the Word of God can teach us all that we need to know about this matter of home improvement. Amen? If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 19. 
Matthew chapter 19. I'm going to read uh, from uh, verse 4 to verse 6. The Bible reads, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh." What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put us under. Flip over to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 18 and we're going to go to the end of the chapter. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible reads, and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, a helpmate uh, for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every, uh, every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would, uh, he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every a living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave the names to all the cattle, and to uh, the fowl of the air, and to every uh, beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmate, a helpmate for him. And the Lord uh, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her uh, unto the man. And And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, Flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the, uh, uh, and they were both, uh, sorry, and they were both uh, uh, naked, and uh, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Obviously. We know, uh, we know that uh, the truth that when the, the end of this life seems certain, people's thoughts would invariably turn to God. Oftentimes, that's when people think about God the most, is when there's some sort of tragedy, whether it be the fact of, I remember you know, back in 2001 when the Twin Towers were hit, what happened? All people, for the next couple of weeks, all of a sudden turned to God. They went to church. Like the entire nation was like going to church. Or when a person, you know, has been, you know, uh, has gone to the doctor, they've given them, you know, the death notice of you've got cancer, or, you've got this, or you whatever. All of a sudden, they, they want to go to church or they want to hear about God. Well, here's, a, I want to share a little story for you, and it's, you know, um, definitely very, uh, it's, it's from a real life experience. It's about a man who shared this. He said that he was having some dip- of difficulties on his job. And it appeared that, it might, that he might even lose his job. He was called by the CEO of the company to come to headquarters. He made the plane arrangements and was greatly troubled about it. He could think of, of nothing but his job and his job security. He got on the plane, and as the plane was making its way to the city where the home company was located, all he could do about, uh, think about was his job. And when he was... And when he was going to encounter, uh, and what he was going to encounter, when he met with the CEO, in the course of the, of the flight, the plane got into some seri- a very serious trouble. It appeared that it was going down, and that he might lose his life. He says that when that occurred, suddenly everything that had been a concern to him, every uh, worry related to his job situation, disappeared, and his thoughts were dominated by thoughts concerning his family. He said that when you really get down to it, the bottom line is not so much your social connections, it is not so much your financial circumstances, it's not even so much your job. What really matters when you get to the bottom line is family. Oftentimes we worry about things that don't need to be worried about. 
God said he's going to su- supply all of our need, right? He's going to supply all of our need. He's going to take care of us. But the thing is that oftentimes what takes the place of where our, our focus should be upon the Lord and upon our family is the fact that we forget that and we leave them behind because money is more important or the job is more important or, or you know, who, who we're connected to is more important than those things. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. It's good, obviously, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, you know, for the men to go out and work and provide for their family, but the thing is, is that if your job is so much more important to where you're never around your kids, you're never around your wife, then that's going to take a toll. I'm not saying for you to sit at home and collect off the government like some people do. I'm saying, you know what? Men go out and get a job and work. Of course, the great authority on the family is the Lord Jesus Christ. I have read, you know, I already read, the, you know, the, his words this morning on the matter when I was talking about Matthew and I was also talking about in Genesis. These words reveal to us when it comes to marriage and family, Jesus Christ uh, knows everything that there is about home improvement. We know also that the devil is the great home wrecker. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy the family unit. That's what he's been doing over the past, I mean, for, uh, ever since the beginning. But we've seen it even more so over the past several years where, you know what, it's like, oh, you don't have to do this. Oh, you can decide whatever you are. You can decide whatever you want to be today. If you want to change it, you know, next week it's okay. It's like we're living in, a, uh, in, a, in this fantasy world. We're not living in reality, or they are not living in rea- reality, those people that want to say that they're this, this, and this. That there's 97 genders and whatever, I don't know what they're talking about. The devil has, uh, has a number of tools in his arsenal in, uh, in order to destroy the family. We know that divorce is an enemy of the family. The Bible, uh, I mean, the, the, one of the statistics that, you know, that says it says nearly one out of every two marriages in our country ends in divorce. That is no different for the church. The church should be different, shouldn't they? We should be different. There, divorce should not be up there with the world. Alcohol is an enemy of the family. Almost every situation where there is marital discord and family problems, you will find that alcohol is right in the middle of it. And people say, well, you know what? The Bible says that we are allowed to drink. We can do all. That's a sermon for another day. But everybody knows that oftentimes when that you know, is a part of it is because, you know what? Alcohol does stuff and changes people. Materialism is also an enemy of the family. In our families, we have an abundance of material things. We like things, don't we? we got to have things. But that doesn't seem to make us very happy, does it? We have all these things. We have all these things that sit around. I mean, think about it. You know, you know, we just had Christmas a few months ago. We all opened presents. How many of those presents are you still playing with? Kids. Parents. I just remember my daughter, you know, uh, when she was younger... We would go out and get her the toy that she wanted. She had more fun playing with the box that it came in than she did with the actual toy. So I said, you know what, you should just let me, you know, uh, next time to say that you want the box, I'll talk to them about getting the box. It's a lot cheaper than it is, you know, actually getting the toy. Now she wants all, now she wants all, uh, you know, the stuff inside the box. You still play with the box. We have more cars and yet less compatibility. We have more gadgets, and yet we have less grace. We have more luxuries, and yet we have less love. We are finding out that the accumulation of material things does not necessarily give you a a stable, happy family. So we know, obviously, that Jesus is the great home builder, that as we talked about in Matthew chapter, uh, in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 4, as we read, it says, And you'll notice, what does it say? Have you not read? Have you not read? Then he goes on and uh, and he quotes from Genesis, right? uh, He is referring to the, the formation of the original marriage and the original family. The Bible says 
that God brought all the animals to Adam so that Adam could give them a name, right? All the animals came before uh, Adam, uh, all the animals came, uh, came before Adam, and ga- uh, he gave them the name he wanted them to have. This process was not to see how smart Adam was, but uh, God used this to build within Adam a desire for a mate. When Adam saw all the animals and their respective mates, it dawned on him that he was alone in the world. God had, you know, he had God, but there was not another person with whom Adam could share his life. As God said in verse 18, this was a situation that was what? Not good. God created this desire within Adam for a mate, and he decide, uh, he's uh, satisfied that desire. The Bible says, uh, or the Bible tells us how God formed the woman uh, you know, from Adam's rib and gave her to man. So God planned, organized, and constructed the first wedding. The animals were the witnesses. On that day, God brought Adam and Eve together in a holy matrimony. So the family unit was formed, and the first marriage came into existence. In Matthew uh, chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, which I had just read, Jesus quotes from Genesis 2. He makes you know, a straightened statement. He mentions that twice in the verses that I have read to you, he says in verse 5, he says this, They twain shall be one flesh. Then he says it again in verse 6, the, uh, uh, they are no more twain, but one flesh. This is the same God. This is, this is the same thing that God says in Genesis chapter 2. God uses some very strange math here, doesn't he? The Word of God says that God took one man and one woman, and he puts them together, and they became one. One plus one equals one. My daughter's shaking her head because she knows math, and you know, it's not her favorite subject, but she knows that one plus one doesn't equal one. But it comes to the Lord, the Lord says one plus one equals one. And that's what I want to talk to you about for a few moments, because this is some very strange math indeed, isn't it? I want to do some math today. I'm talking about the prim- this morning I'm going to talk primarily about the husband and wife relationship. If you're going to have a strong family and a strong relationship between parent and child and siblings in the family, you first, uh, you first of all uh, have to have a strong marriage relationship. God says the way to have a strong fam- a family relationship is to understand that one plus one equals one. And I know that, I'm, I'm sure this morning that there are certain serious math lovers. I know that Miss Rose was a, was a math teacher for years. And she could probably sit there and start shaking her head and say, Pastor, I'm sorry that one plus one does not equal one. But when we come to the Lord, it does say one plus one equals one. First, I want to talk to you about one plus one equals one physically. One plus one equals one physically. Now, as this, you know, this morning, if you're single or, you know, or, or uh, you know, divorced or whatever it is, you say, well, I don't have a spouse. I don't have anything to worry about. I don't need to hear this, you know, so I can just shut it out and tune it out for, you know, for the next, you know, uh, you know, 30 minutes or so. I want to tell you this. Take notes because the thing is, is that if, if God it brings along that, that godly uh, spouse for you, you need to know these principles. We know that God was made in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1. We know that. The Bible teaches that God is a trinity. That is, God is a Godhead made up in, uh, of three persons. He is the Father, and He is the Son, and He is the Holy Spirit. Man is a trinity as well. Every person is made up of body, soul, and spirit. The Bible, uh, the Bible says in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God made the human body. He breathed the spirit into him and man became a living soul. That one verse tells us that there are three aspects to every human being. There is, uh, there is a part of us that is physical, there's a part of us that is uh, psychological, and there's a part of us that is spiritual. When a marriage takes place as God intended, 
the man and the woman become one physically. They become one psychologically. They become one spiritually. We want uh, to begin by exploring the physical portion of our lives. There is a physical union that occurs within the marriage relationship. There are several statements about the physical relationship that exists between a husband and a wife I feel need to be made. In the physical marital relationship, in the context of the physical marital relationship, sex is a gift of God, is the gift of God. Sex is God's idea. Sex is good. Sex is of God, and it is good when it is within the circle God intends for it to be in the circle of marriage. It is when we get out of that parameter that everything gets messed up, right? That is when we have all kinds of disagreements, all kinds of arguments, all kinds of drama that we don't need. If we would follow what God's word says about the marriage relationship, about sex and all those things, things would go well. And I don't want to spend, you know, I don't want to spend a great deal of time on the physical oneness, but I want I do want to hit some uh, hit on some highlights. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there is a word about perversion. In these, uh, if you uh, would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's ver- look at verses 6, or sorry, 9 through uh, 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. The Bible reads, Know ye not that unrighteousness shall not in, uh, inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor uh, yeah, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor uh, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And as such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In these verses, Paul is, you see, Paul is speaking of how some pervert God's, uh, God's plan for human sexuality. He warns that those who misuse sex, that they give proof of their lost condition before God and before man. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, God speaks of those who use, uh, who use it properly. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, uh, 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are uh, naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we, uh, we have to do. Here's, the, here's, here's a big thing that people need to understand and realize. Because what the world wants to teach you is that we're all animals. We are not all animals. We, do not, we are not to, uh, to act like animals and behave like animals and do all those things. Why? Because God set a, a day aside specifically to make man, to make woman in his image. And who does God give dominion over? It is the animals. God wanted a relationship with man and woman. God wanted a relationship with humanity, not with the animals. God said, you know what, that it is good that, it, it is good that man has a helpmate, his wife. He doesn't, talk about like that, he doesn't talk like that about the animals. He creates the animals, and man gives the animals names. But God says, I want to have a relationship with you, not the animals. You are not an animal like evolution teaches why do you, this is the reason why, you know, so many people say, well, you know, we're just animals, you know, we just got to act like, they do, and they begin to what? Act like animals. Because if you're told something long enough, you're going to begin to act that way. If you're told that you're stupid all your life, you're going to think you're stupid. If you're told that you're an animal all your life, you're going to think that you're an animal. You are not stupid, and you are not an animal. Sex can be either a good thing, or it can be a bad thing. Which it, is, uh, which it depends on where it is found. Let me illustrate this. Is mud good or bad? Mud is good in the pink pen, right? But it is bad when it's on your carpet. 
Is fire good or bad? Fire is good when it is uh, being good to, you know, to cook me some food and to keep me warm, but it is bad when it burns your house down. I mean, think about this. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Start at verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep, uh, to keep thee from evil woman, uh, to keep thee from evil woman, women, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her uh, take thee with her uh, eyelids. For by, uh, for by means of a whorish woman, a, uh, a man is brought uh, to a piece of bread, and the adulteress, the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire into his bosom and his, and his clothes not be burned? Can one uh, go, unto, uh, go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Verse 29, So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife... Whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. So we begin to look at these things. We begin to you know, see these things of what he is talking about. You know what? Fire is good, right? When it you know, is to cook and to keep you warm. It is a bad thing. As he says, can you take fire you know, it, you know, and, uh, and lay it upon your bosom and not be burned? That's a bad situation. The reason why we have marital unfaithfulness is because oftentimes what ends up happening is that we don't check ourselves and we end up wrecking ourselves. We sit there and think, you know what, my, my spouse does not, you know, is not doing what I want to do. You know, I was told you know, that it was going to be like this when I got married. They're not meeting that standard. They're not doing all this. And so all of a sudden when somebody else shows you attention, what ends up happening you end up taking that coal and put it, in, you know, put it in your lap, put it in your in your bosom, and what ends up happening? You get burned. The grass is not always greener on the other side. It is not going to be green on that other side. I'll tell you that right now. We live in a we're living in a culture today where people, especially young people, are being told that there is no. Uh, there's nothing spiritual about sex. People talk casual about it. We live in a generation of people who have been brought up in America, who have been taught and believe that they are basically come from animals, like I said earlier. Therefore, if they come from animals, it is right, you know, it is all right if they live their lives as animals. Our generation ha- has come to believe that they can just do, uh, you know, they can do marital things with people that are not their spouses. The philosophy, obviously, is if it feels good, do it. Parents, I'm going to give you this illustration. Do not give your children birth control. For one, every single time that somebody, you know, uh, that you... For one thing, that you are with another person in that way, in a marital way, what ends up happening. If you read what it means, what it actually means is that you have an abortion, but yet it's not the way the world defines an abortion. Because what ends up happening is, is that that egg will go to the uterus and the sperm, but what ends up happening is that that birth control will make it detach and they'll say, you know what, it was never a pregnancy in the first place. Yes, it was. Because at conception, at conception... That is when that person becomes a living being. Because you know what they say? At conception, everything, the DNA and everything else change. And that becomes a person at that point. You can sit there and argue the fact if you want to. But the thing is, is that as soon as that sperm hits the egg, what ends up happening is that the DNA is changed. And it it is a separate person. Don't give me that my body, my choice malarkey. That is not your body. That is somebody else. Your body, your choice. You made that choice when you decided to be with that other person in a way that was not honoring to God in the first place. Here's the other thing. Don't give your child that birth control because what that says is that you're saying, you know what, it's okay for you to go out and do marital things without somebody that's not your spouse. Don't do it. If you don't want to be a grandparent at at an early age, you say, well, how did this happen? Don't sit there and you know, give them the ammunition to go do it. The 
Let's look at what God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. What? Know ye not that, that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. There's that, again, that one flesh statement. Something occurs within, uh, uh, when the sexual act occurs, whether it be between a husband and a wife or whether it be, two, uh, be between two people who are not married. However, the marriage relationship is not a casual act. That physical relationship that happens in the confines of marriage is not something casual. It is, uh, it is something that takes place that is spiritual. Something that takes a place psychologically. Something that, you know, that takes a place, obviously, physically as well. So it is no casual matter. There's a reason why when somebody has had a physical relationship outside of marriage, and then all of a sudden they decide that they want to break up, that there's such remorse. When that relationship exists outside the bounds of marriage that God has established, it never ends well. It brings fear and disease and unwanted, it brings the fear of disease and unwanted pregnancy. It brings about guilt. It shatters relationships. When uh, sex occurs outside the boundaries created by God, it reveals the true nature of your spiritual life and your relationship to God. There's also a word about prevention. Look at verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, eight, of chapter 6. It says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So what does he say? Flee fornication. Don't do it. Stay away from it. That means what? Run. You should never get yourself in a, in a position where you can be compromised in that way. You should never expose yourself to any influences that will cause you to be unfaithful in your marriage relationship or impure in that area of your life. Do not expose yourself to anything that, would, that could hinder your walk with the Lord, damage your relationship, or harm your relationship with your spouse. When it comes to sin and immorality, flee, run. You know what? Be a first-class coward. Run from it. Everybody, you know, has, you know, has probably heard about uh, about Joseph. Joseph, you know, was working, you know, was working for Potiphar. He was one of the higher ups in all of Egypt. But one day, Potiphar's wife, who was not saved, got her eyes on Joseph, and she burned in her lust towards that man. Then one day, she reached out uh, to to grab Joseph, but the only thing she got was his garment. All she got was his coat. He did not lose his character. He ran. That is what we ought to do when sexual temptation comes up in life, is run from it. That we don't sit there and say, you know what, I think I'm going to just stay around just a little bit longer. Or I can handle this. No. Run. There's also a word about provision. Let's look, uh, again look at 1 Corinthians. We're going to be down in chapter 7 now. Verses 2 and 3. It says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Makes sense, doesn't it? Let, uh, let the man render unto, his, uh, unto the wife do, uh, do benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. These ver verses make it clear that we are uh, to have, you know, that not only is that marriage physical relationship, you know, that marital intimacy that we are to have is not only for procreation. It's not only to have kids. Do you know that? But it is also intended for pleasure, as I just said. There's nothing wrong with, with, you know, uh, with that relationship between a husband and a wife as they, uh, they bring about physical oneness. There's something wrong in a relationship when physical intimacy is not a regular part of the marriage. Do you know that? That you are to be, uh, you know, you are supposed to have that marital physical intimacy with your spouse. The Bible says there's something wrong when you don't. It 
And just so you know, you so you know, for you know, for some that may be older in here, you say, "Well, Pastor, I'm older. That's that that's that, that sail, you know, that that boat, you know, that's you know, that ship has sailed." The Bible never gives an age. It no, it doesn't. The Bible never gives an age where you are, you know, where you are not to, supposed to be you know, a physical with your spouse in an intimate way. Number two. One plus one equals one psychologically. Not only does a married couple, a couple become only one body, but they also become one soul. We each possess a physical nature, and we, have a, we all have a psychological nature as well. That means that you, present, uh, you possess an intellect. You think, you have emotions, you feel, you have volition, you, have, uh, you make decisions, you have a will. You exercise that will. You have a free will. When we are married, we become, we become one physically with our spouse. But we also become one with them mentally. You say, how is that possible? Just a, you know, just a little illustration here. How many times you know, have you known a couple that has been married for, se- for several years, say like 10 years, and it's like, you know what, you know what your spouse is thinking. Don't use that when you're in the middle of a disagreement. I know what you're thinking because I guarantee you're not going to be right no matter what. It is in a marriage that partners work together toward this whole matter of psychological compatibility. Sometimes people will get a divorce and they will state uh, as their grounds for, for that, they, uh, that they have come to believe that that is a fact, that the fact is, is that they are incompatible. One man said, you know, this, and it's really, really nice, uh, it's, a, it's a great thought. He says, you know what, that he and his wife are happily incompatible. They're happily incompatible. The problem that many couples experience is the fact that they fail to factor God into their incompatibilities. Not everyone, not, not every marriage relationship is everyone going to agree 100% of the time. You're not marrying yourself. And even if you could marry yourself, in which that's impossible, you still would argue with yourself. That's why I often say, you know, times like, you know, if, and let's just, you heard me say this, you know, a couple of times, and she's asked me this question as well. You know, she may hear me, you know, talk to myself, or I, I may hear her talk to herself. I said, are you talking to yourself? And she said, yeah. I said, how's it going? And she said, oh, it's all right. You know, whatever. I said, you're not arguing with yourself, are you? She goes, no. She goes, I ain't got that bad yet. But to think about it, you know, it's one of those things that we are going to, you know, that we should realize that, you know what? We should realize that we are, we should be happily incompatible. That realize, hey, you know what? The person you married is what? The opposite sex. The opposite gender, Right? That's the reason why they call it opposite. Why? Because you're not going to agree on everything. I mean, if you guys agree on everything, I mean, I, I just want to know how you do it. Because somebody is not telling you, you know, the other person is not telling you, uh, you know, what they're thinking if you're agreeing 100% of the time. And I'm not saying you should argue all the time either. But what the thing is, is that what I mean by happily incompatible is that they try to make it work. But oftentimes, sometimes people, you know, get into the fact of they don't bring God into the equation. And so what they're using in order to make it work is human energy. And when it doesn't go, you know, the way that they want it to go, they throw the marriage away like it was a piece of trash. Because, you know, the other person doesn't agree with them. They're like, you know what, I'm done with you. We used to agree all the time. That was called, you know, like the honeymoon phase. Honeymoon phase wears off. You have to choose every single morning that you wake up that you're going to love your spouse. Now, you may not like some of the things your spouse does, but you you better choose the fact that you you love them every single day, despite their flaws. Nowadays, there's no sense of commitment. There's no sense of absolute devotion. Where are the people who would rather die than allow their marriages to fail? I'm talking, about, uh, I'm talking about working towards achieving psychological oneness. That you know what? There's this thing called compromise within your marriage. 
I want to warn you of the dangers that modern uh, secular psychology has placed, and most of the people in church believe it. There is a place for psychology. I'm not saying that psychology in and of itself is bad, but we must place it under the authority of God's word. If, if psychology, modern uh, you know, psychology goes against God's word, then it's not right. Believe God's word. That is truth. It is possible to gain a great deal of insight from extensive research into the human mind that has been conducted, right? But it is possible also to, and it is also possible to glean from the concepts that teach us about how families are to come together. But I, uh, but there is a difference between hearing human opinion and what is based on the word of God. Don't be going to Dr. Phil and Oprah. How many times has Oprah been married? I think she's been married about like four or five times, and I think right now she's single. She said, you know what, she's just, you know, in her mind, she's single. She says she's just, you know, not going to get married anymore. She's just going to be with people. So why would you even go to her? Intellectual oneness comes through what? Communication. To develop, uh, to develop intellectual oneness, oneness of mind and thought, there has to be Communication. I'm going to talk you know, more about that you know, in, you know, in a later sermon about that. But I want to you know, say the thing, I'm going, to, I'm going to just go right up and admit it right now up, up front, that men, that we men are normally a large problem when it comes to this area of communication. I see some heads nodding on that one. And some of, it's, uh, you know, some of the guys in here are saying that. We just don't communicate our, fear, uh, our feelings very well, do we? If our wife asks us to, well, how do you feel? Well, we don't want to say anything. Maybe I'm just the only one. Maybe, I mean, if you're able to do that, that's great. You have good communication. But also, you know what? It can work the other way where the, you know, the wife doesn't you know, communicate as well either. Let me just give you a few thoughts about this. Learn to listen to the other person. When you talk, it would be good to look at one another. I sit there and I think about that because of the fact is that sometimes, you know, I mean, and it just, you know, I guess it just happens. You know, I could be sitting in my chair, at my, uh, you know, at my house. My wife could be sitting on the couch and we'll begin to, t- you know, we could talk about different things like, hey, what do you want to watch or whatever. And I don't look at my wife because I just want to know what she wants to watch. But then if the situation turns to something, obviously, you know, that's more important, I should probably do what? Turn off the TV, pause it, do whatever, and turn and look to my wife. And it, and it goes, you know, vice versa, you know, as well as, you know, ladies, obviously, you know, you know turn as well to your spouse, uh, to your husband. Here's the other thing. It also may not even hurt you to lean forward and get a little closer to one another when you're talking to each other, especially on that kind of level. Because there's been many a times for myself, and I'll just tell you this, there's been many a times my wife has, you know, said, you know, has told me something, and I was listening. And then later on, I'll say, well, you never told me this. I'm not trying to get, guys, I'm not trying to get you in trouble. I'm just telling you what happens to me at my house. And my wife says, yes, I did. Just so you know, men, most of the time, you know, you know wives, they have like a tape recorder in their head. As soon as you say that whatever, they know it. There's no, there's no use to saying, no, you never told me that. You can argue all you want. It's not going to end well. I just know that, you know, there's been times where I have said, you know, I was listening, but I wasn't really listening and then she'll you know, say, I told you about this two weeks ago. And she'll, I mean, she can get down to, you know, the, you know, she's like, I told you. I remember we were having dinner. It was right around, you know, 5.30 or 6. And this is the conversation. You didn't realize, you know, men, you didn't realize that when you got married to your wife, that she was a court reporter too, right? She can bring out those records, you know, just that, you know, quick. We also, you know, uh, you know another thing about, another thought about communication Learn to handle your anger. We have so much anger in our culture. We have so much anger in our family relationships. 
I think about just this past week, and I can sit there and blame it on the medication that I'm on. But there's times where, you know, I know that my daughter or my wife has asked me something, and I have responded, not the best. Did it need that? No. They didn't come to me, you know, with any kind of anger or anything else. And I can sit there, you know, it's the medication. Well, I like to think that even if I'm on medication, I still should be able to control myself, right? When, we, uh, when people are angry, you know, they usually handle it in one of, usually, you know, one of several ways. Sometimes they just blow up. Sometimes, you know, other times they'll just clam up, they won't say anything. I do both of these. And sometimes they just throw up, as in the past. They'll bring up records of things that they did, happened. Well, don't you remember back in 1987, this is what you said and this and this? Don't do it. Learn to handle the anger. Next one is, we have to learn to open up and learn to properly express ourselves. We also need to learn to avoid certain words. We know exactly what words to say to push that button. Don't we? You know the words that, you know, that, can, you know, that can cut them and cause them pain. We all know, you know, like I said, we all know which buttons to push, don't we? If we really want to. We have to work and learn to get rid of those kind of words that we don't use them. Just because we know them doesn't mean you have to use them. Next, learn to, uh, learn to not dwell on the past. Learn to not dwell on the past. There comes a time when you have to let the, uh, let the past go. If you, want to sing, uh, you know, if you want to think about that song that was you know, a few years ago, let it go. Just let it go. There comes a time when forgiveness kicks in and the past is allowed to be the past and you begin to move forward. Don't keep bringing up the past. If you, say that, if you said that you've forgiven them, forgive them and move on. Some of you, here, uh, some of you are sitting here today and have a truckload of past that you've been hauling around in your marriage and in your family, and every time an issue comes up in your family, you just, drink, uh, you just drag all the old past out. You have to learn not to dwell in the past. When it comes to communications between spouses, let me give you a, a few quick thoughts. Be careful what you say. Be careful how you say it. Be, care, be careful when you say it. And be careful why you say it. I'm preaching this as much to myself as I am to you. There's also emotional oneness. The word, you know, the, the operative word here is consideration. We have to learn to be considerate of one another. There are three basic needs every individual has. Every person needs to be loved. Number two, every person needs to be respected. They need to feel that they have self-worth and that they are a person. Why am I telling you all this? Because usually you do not come out against people in public, like your friends, family, or people that you have. You don't you know, usually just blurt out something or say something to somebody you don't know that well, or even if it's your best friend. The person you usually explode on is your, uh, your spouse because you feel like it's okay to do that. We need to treat others, that would be like our spouse, as we would treat others. Number three, every person needs to feel appreciated. They need to feel like when they do, uh, they do uh, what they do matters to someone and that someone is appreciative of the things that they do. Don't get into the mentality of, well, I'm not going to thank them for doing that. That's what they're supposed to do. What, are they a worker, an employee? If your spouse, you know, go, goes over and does the dishes, you know, whatever, thank them for it. If they change the bed sheets... Thank them for it. Be considerate. You know what? They want to know, they want you to know that, hey, you know what? You are at least re, uh, recognizing and seeing those things. You don't sit there and say, well, you know what? She's supposed to do that. Or he's supposed to do that. 
you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, ladies, if your husband come, you know, comes home after a long day's work, you know what, just say, hey, you know what, thank you for working so hard for our family. Or if your husband comes, you know, uh, you know, your husband's coming home and, you know, the, the house may be not as immaculate as you like, realize there's, there's people in that house that also destroy it. Usually the little ones. Instead of saying, wow, this is a pigsty. What did you do all day? Didn't you do anything? Why don't you say, hey, you know what? You did an awesome job and then pick something. And then you know what? After that, I say, you know what? Let me help you with doing this so we can get this done. Like I said, there will always be some measure of incompatibility between spouses, but we can work toward achieving greater harmony in our marriage relationships. Married couples become one physically. They become one. They also become one psychologically, and one plus one equals one spiritually. How many of you know that you are more than a body with skin and bones and organs? You are more than a soul with thoughts and feelings and and with drives and desires. You are also spirit. That means that you have a spiritual nature. That means that you, uh, you have the capacity to relate to God. If you do not understand the spiritual component of marriage and family... You may, have, you may have everything else in your family, and you will, all, you will have this gnawing feeling that there is still something missing in your relationship. What will be missing is your spiritual oneness. I believe that the most important thing we need to learn in marriage and family is that we need to be like Jesus. How does uh, being like Jesus relate to marriage and family? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives uh, uh, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He is saying that in our marriage relationships, we have to learn to love, uh, love one another the way that Jesus loves us. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Might be all the times. Because he's the only one that's perfect and we're not perfect, right? How did Jesus love us? Jesus loved us sacrificially. I'm going to get that word out. The Bible says that Christ gave himself for the church. Christ loved the church. We have to learn to love like Jesus loved. This is, that is why God forbids saved people from marrying unsaved people. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and uh, and what communion hath light with darkness? God tells us not uh, not to be yoked or be married with who? If we're a believer, we're not supposed to be married to an unbeliever. Now, obviously, I understand, you know, the difference between that and the fact of, hey, you're both not, you know, saved when you got married, and then all of a sudden one person gets saved. And then you say, well, the other person's not saved, so that means, you know, I can, you know, divorce them? No, the Bible says as much as, you know, as much as within you lies, you know what, try to make peace with them so that hopefully they get saved as well. We're not to just all of a sudden be like, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to leave you just because you're not saved. And I am. Now, I've heard, you know, you know, and I know of situations where a person got saved and their spouse didn't. And their spouse, the spouse that was not saved, got angry and mad because that person got saved. I've heard of situations where a person, you know, came up, uh, you know, the, the spouse had come up and, you know, and said, choose me or choose Jesus, but you can't have both. And the spouse has come back, to, you know, the believer has says, hey, don't you know that I love you now more than I ever have? But they, the unsaved person will not understand that. Why? Because to them, they see it as, you know what, you love something more than you love me. But when we love Jesus Christ, that's the only way we're able to love our spouse more than we love ourselves. And I've heard of, you know, marriages break up because of the fact that, that you know, the saved person says, well, you know what? I love the Lord, but I love you as well. And the other person will say, you know what? Nope. If you don't want me, 
That's the end of it. If you don't want just me and only me, that's the end of it. Even when both partners are saved, it is still hard to love your mate like Jesus loved the church. Listen carefully. It's hard for you to love your mate the way that you should all the time. But not for the reason you think. It's hard for you to love your mate, not because of your mate, but because of you. Well, pastor, I'm done with you. I'm going to leave now. Now you're pointing fingers at me. I already told you, I said, I'm preaching a sermon to myself as much as I'm preaching it to you. Most of us are basically selfish. Most of us enter into marriage and family with the wrong idea. We come in asking, not what, uh, what uh, can we give to this relationship, but what we can get from this relationship. I've watched couples... You know, I, I, you know, I've seen mar- you know, couples get married. I, I, I've performed the marriage ceremony for some of them. And you know what? They'll come to me for counseling. Right before they get married, they're all like lovey-dovey. Oh, you're the sweetest. He can never do anything wrong. Oh, she's the best. And they think that they're headed into paradise. You know, for, uh, they, they think that they're headed for paradise. And some don't know it, but actually what they're headed for is World War III. They're so innocent. Most couples enter into marriage like two ticks on a dog. Just so you know, a tick is, is like a, paras- uh, is a little parasite which attaches itself to a host. A tick gets on a dog and sucks the blood out of the dog. The tick contributes nothing to the dog. It just sucks the blood out of the dog. The problem in marriage is that sometimes you have two ticks and no dog. You you just have two people who are draining the life out of one another with neither partner contributing anything to the relationship, and it's all about what each can get out of the other one. And we know that's a recipe for disaster. Don't be a bloodsucker. The number one problem in marriage and family is selfishness. The marriage family becomes about me, my needs, and what I want and what I think with absolutely no regard for my spouse. It is a recipe for disaster. It, is also, it also pulls apart from the attitude Jesus demonstrated when he died for those who did not deserve his love and his grace. The best thing that could uh, ever happen in homes is for the, the husband and the wife to become more like Jesus. We must learn to love our mate and love our family as Jesus loved the church. Some couples, some married couples, have been trying everything that they know. They've been to uh, counseling sessions. they read books. And what they really need is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be like Jesus Christ until you become, uh, until you come to Jesus Christ and have him come and change your life. Until you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not have a new birth experience. You cannot be like Jesus. Uh, uh, um, there are a lot of couples, excuse me, there are a lot of couples that need this, that need Jesus Christ. All couples need Jesus Christ. And you know, uh, so this morning, if that's one of the, you know, the things you say, you know what, I need to admit that I'm a sinner and call on Jesus to save my soul, that is the best, that is the greatest home improve, uh, improvement project you could ever partake in. If you ever get your heart renovated, your life renovated, it could change the spiritual temperature of your home. It could transform things. If you've never watched the movie uh, Fireproof that came out a few years ago with Kirk Cameron, Watch it. You'll see what can happen when one spouse gets saved and the other one, you know, is not quite saved. And what it, what it means when you start putting the other one before you. It can, it can literally change that, you know, the spiritual atmosphere in your house. It would forever revolutionize, you know, your marriages. Let me make us, uh, some suggestions as I close. If you already know a Christ as your Savior... I want to suggest to you that you institute a family altar in your home. I mean by 
What I mean by that is that, that you spend some time at the beginning of the day, you gather as a family, and you read God's Word together and pray. Now, you don't have to read a lot. You could just read a verse or two and then pray. But moms and dads, you need to pray for your sons and daughters as they go out into schools or, or wherever they go. You need to pray that God would protect them and uh, uh, give them courage and grace. Wives, you need to pray that the man, uh, that the man uh, for your husband as he walks out the door and goes to work. Husbands, you need to pray for your wife as she goes, if she stays at home or she goes out into the workforce, you need to pray for her. Start the day in the Bible, reading and praying. Have a family altar. If you will build your family around the church, we can get you resources and we have resources here for you. There's an opportunity here for God to work mightily in your family. It will make a difference if you will uh, establish a strong church relationship in your marriage and in your family. Why am I talking about the church? Because the thing is, is that iron sharpens iron. We have, you know, we have families that are newly married. We have families that have been married for several years and several decades. You can learn from one another. You don't learn from one another. You don't learn from other couples and everything else if you never go to church. What you learn from is other couples that are having problems and everything else because they're not saved. And they don't have any idea of how to have a, a successful marriage. Some marriages have gotten so bad that spouses are only together because of the kids. And then as soon as the kids move out of the house, then they get divorced, destroying the family. Let me tell you this. It does not change the fact of whether you get divorced early in your marriage or late in marriage. The thing is, is that you're still getting divorced and you're still showing your kids that it's not worth it. Don't. Don't even allow that word divorce to come into your marriage. It should never be spoken as a way to get what you want. Never. Don't ever go to your spouse and say, you know what, if you don't straighten up, you know, I think I'll just go out and get a divorce. Do not ever, listen to me, hear me when I say this, do not ever use divorce as a way of getting what you want. Even if you're playing around or messing around. What I despise is the fact that when a husband or a wife will sit there and talk about their quote-unquote girlfriend or boyfriend of saying, you know what, if I were to ever leave my spouse, I would leave it for this person. They'll say, oh, well, it's just a celebrity. It doesn't matter. It creates insecurity. Don't do it. Do not do it. You love that person as Christ has loved the church. What did Christ do for you? Everything. And you better give everything to your spouse. As I already said, there's going to be times where you don't agree. There's going to be that moment where you agree to disagree, or you have that compromise, but you never you know, flaunt the fact of the option of divorce. Never. Never. Can, can you hear me? Can you understand what I'm saying? God would say, never do that. His word does say that, to never use divorce. As I said, one plus one equals one. Obviously, we, we see this morning that God does some strange math, doesn't he? He is able to take two people from two totally different backgrounds, bring them together in Jesus, and then make them one physically, psychologically, and spiritually. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I just wonder today, do, do you need to come and to pray with your spouse at the, at the altar? Do you need to bring your children before the Lord today? Do you need to commit to their spiritual formation today? Of saying, you know what, I'm not gonna, you know, no longer just gonna let them just kind of, you know, flounder out there in the world or understand what, the, you know, not understand what the Bible says, but actually teach them what it says. And some will say, I don't know the Bible that well. If you want to start your mornings off, start off with a proverb. Proverbs has amazing principles in it. Do you need to repent of some sin, of some selfishness or self-centeredness? 
And lastly, do you need to come to Jesus Christ for salvation? Sorry, that's not the last one. This is one I want. Do you need to apologize to your spouse for the way that you've acted toward them? Is that something that you need to do? So for the next few moments, I want you to think about those questions that I asked you. Do you need, do you need to come up here with your spouse and, and, and pray with them? Do you need to bring your children before the Lord? Do you need uh, to commit to, the, to their spiritual formation today? Because husbands, you are the head of the house. Everything rises and falls upon you. If you don't do it, I'm just not saying that there are not ladies out there you know, that haven't led it, but they're not supposed to. The men you are supposed to lead. Do you need to repent of that of some sin, of some selfishness, and so, or self-centeredness? Do you need to apologize to your spouse for the way that you've acted towards them? Or do you need to come to Jesus Christ for salvation? For the next few moments, if that's you, I just ask that you would come forward. And I'm not going to think anything less, for, you know, less of you if you say, you know what, I'm not able to quite walk up there and do it, but I want to do it you know, at my seat. That's fine. But you need to make those, you know, those, you need to take this opportunity and not sit there and wait and say, well, I'll think about it. So the next few moments, let's begin, you know, to ask the Lord what he would have us to do.